Okay, welcome back to astronomy. Let's talk about the properties of light. We like to think of light as a cosmic messenger carrying information from celestial objects. And if we take an object like a prism, we can take that light and break it up into its color components, allowing us to analyze the light and perhaps determine um, its composition, its speed, and maybe even its age, mass, and things like that. It takes a lot of work to analyze light, but a prism is one tool you can use to, to analyze light. Another one is a diffraction grating. Now this image right here was a, 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 a camera had a diffraction grating in front of it. So it had a piece of plastic with closely spaced lines scratched into it in various orientations. And it leads to a diffraction effect rather than a refraction effect like we had for the prism. So diffraction leads to a Roy G. Biv color spectrum like this. And if you zoom in on it, on the spectrum of the sun in particular, you'll see that it has missing lines. Those dark lines are, well, somewhat mysterious until you look closely at them and you realize it's telling us something about what the sun is made out of. That means we could use it to also determine what other stars are made out of as well. This is the um, more um, higher resolution spectrum of the sun. And the question we have when we're first getting started in spectroscopy is how do you decipher this to figure out what it all means in terms of the sun's composition, age, speed, and also, can you do the same thing for other stars out there in the universe? Now, you're going to hear me talk about electromagnetic radiation, light, and photons, all kind of interchangeably because they're all the same thing. It kind of depends on what experiment that you're talking about. So in some cases, you can say that light is can be, just be considered as pure energy. We can say that it's also considered to be electromagnetic waves or electromagnetic radiation. So sometimes light behaves like a wave. If you take an electron and vibrate it up and down, it'll generate waves going out from there. And But sometimes light uh, tends to act like ping pong balls and they act like particles as they move from one object to the other, like from the sun to the surface of the earth. Bundles of energy called photons, particles of light. And as I said, sometimes light behaves like a wave. So when the electrons move around inside the surface of the sun or any light source, such as a light bulb or a flashlight, it generates, uh, the, the moving electrons generates a wave up and down like this called the electric wave. But then perpendicular to that, you also have a magnetic wave. And so uh, those two together give you the electromagnetic wave or electromagnetic radiation. So just like a frog jumping or moving around inside of water generates waves, in the same way, an electron moving around in space generates electromagnetic waves through space. The way that we describe waves scientifically is you make a measurement. So you could say, let's take the distance from crest to crest and call that something, and we call that the wavelength. And the wavelength is simply just defined to be the distance between two successive peaks of the wave or two crests. And you normally um, interpret that with your eye as different colors. So when light of longer wavelengths hits your eye, it sends a signal to your brain and you think, oh, that's red. But if it's a shorter wavelength, you might interpret that as blue or violet. So it's interesting to note that the back of your eye has these color receptors called cones on there. And what they're doing is interpreting what the wavelength of light is and then telling your brain that means color instead of wavelength. Now you can measure the crest, the crest distance in meters if we're talking about a water wave, but for a light wave, it's really small. It's on the order of a nanometer, which is one times 10 to the minus nine meters or one billionth of a meter. To give you an, a sense of, of that number, um, the uh, screen that you're looking at right now is giving off wavelengths from about 400 to 700 nanometers. So anything that you see around the room that you're looking at, at, looking at now that is red, most likely has mostly 700 nanometer light coming to, uh, away from it and anything that's blue is more like 400 uh, nanometers uh, for its wavelength. Now wave period is, is something that is describing 
how much it, uh, the wave wiggles in time, uh, wiggles in space over time. So it's the amount of time it takes for the wave to repeat itself. You could also think of this as the electron moving up and down and then back to its original position. That's the length of time it takes to do that. Or you can say it starts at the crest and it's the length of time for the electron to go from its highest position to its lowest position and then back up. That's the wave period. If you take the frequency, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot about that. Frequency is coming up next. It's measured in seconds in this case. But if you take the reciprocal of the period, you get something called frequency. And you can see that the words are kind of opposite of what you have up here. This is how long it takes for one wiggle. And this is the number of wiggles per unit time. It's talking about how fast or how frequent the electron is moving up and down in space that generates that electromagnetic waves, um, those electromagnetic waves rather. And um, in this case, you got period measured in seconds and frequency is measured in hertz. And uh, we're gonna learn later that uh, radio waves is a form of light. And so when you dial into an FM station, that FM is uh, on the order of megahertz and then the AM station is using kilohertz uh, wiggles of electrons inside of antennas. We'll learn more about uh, radio waves a little bit later. So the connection between those two parameters of a wave is that the wave frequency is equal to one of the period. So the words looked a little bit opposite and also the, the equation kind of bears that out. Uh, the longer it takes for an object to, to wiggle back and forth in time, the, sh uh, the, uh, the lower the frequency. So if you want a high frequency right here, you have to have a short period. Now there is another equation you see within this discussion. Uh, you might be familiar with the letter C used in Einstein's famous equation, E is equal to mc squared. You might know that, that C stands for the speed of light. So that's what we're talking about next, wave speed. So the speed of a wave is basically looking at the crest of that wave and seeing how fast it is moving through space. And they, you have a particular marker in space, a point in space, and you figure out how fast it's going. In the metric system, of course, you would measure that speed in meters per second, but we could also do it in miles per hour or kilometers per second. But mostly we, we're gonna stick to meters per second for some of our measurements. So the connection between wave speed and other things that we've talked about previously so far in this video is that C, the wave speed, is equal to the wavelength, which we indicate with lambda, lambda for wavelength, and F for frequency. And the units work out. If you have um, lambda in meters and you have frequency in hertz, this will come out in meters per second. So if you see the phrase electromagnetic wave velocity, think about an easier way to say that. How would you say that with simpler words? Electromagnetic wave velocity. It kind of sounds like techno babble, right? Well, another way to say this is the speed of light. And one of the cool things about the speed of light is that it's the same for all seven forms of light. And up to this point, you may not know, you may not have known that there are seven different forms of light. And we're gonna learn about those in the, when we talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. So um, if, if we wanna compare light waves to other kind of waves, we can do so by saying, let's look at a water wave. Now we can think of a water wave in a sinusoidal way out in the deep ocean. And if we followed uh, like uh, the crest of a wave, we'd find out that nat uh, nature on the surface of the earth, water waves move about one meter per second. Now meters is just a little more than a yard. So you can actually outrun a wave pretty easily. You can um, move faster than one meter per second. Another type of wave is the speed of sound. And of course you can't travel faster than that just by running and walking or even driving because it's 340 meters per second or around 770 miles per hour. It's quite fast, but uh, faster still is the speed of light, which is 300 million meters per second. So what if you go faster than these speed? What if you're in water and you move faster than one meter per second? What if you're in sound and you move faster than the speed of sound? What if you're 
in, in space and you move faster than the speed of light. Let's look at those three cases. What if you go faster? I might show you a video here before I talk about that. Uh, yeah, let me show you a video and then we'll talk about what goes faster. Um, what happens if you go faster? Let's look at these two numbers right here. You can see that the speed of uh, sound is about a million times slower than the speed of light. Or another way to say that is light is about a million times faster than sound. You know that this is true because you, uh, when you see a thunderstorm, you see the lightning and then hear the thunder a little bit later, right? You see the light and then you hear the thunder a little bit later. Our fathers and grandfathers told us that uh, if there was a one second time delay between when you see the light and hear the thunder, that the object was, or the lightning strike rather, was one mile away. But it turns out that it, it was far closer than what my father and grandfather told me. Um, it's one fifth of a mile. So if you see lightning and, and then hear the thunder five seconds later, then it's one mile. So let me show you some videos in which we can maybe um, count the number of seconds between when you see something and hear something and then measure the distance. All right, so here I have an object that's about to explode and we're gonna see it change and I'm gonna try to hit start as soon as I see something explode. Now I need to put this on stopwatch so we can measure how long it takes for the sound to arrive. So we're gonna see it and then uh, several seconds later, we're going to hear it. So here we go. I saw it, started the clock, and all right. So you can see that that was about 5.81 uh, seconds. So that was a little bit more than a mile away. Let's do, an, let's do another one. All right, I got another video here. Explosion's gonna happen in the distance. Reset my clock, here we go. And as soon as I see it, okay, and I don't hear anything. The light gets there much sooner. So light is traveling a million times faster than the sound. You can already tell that we're more than two miles away. For every five seconds of delay, there's a mile. It looks like we're there at four miles so far. We can tell that we're already five miles from this explosion site, which I definitely want to be that far away. Six miles away. Okay, there it was. So it was about, uh, I guess, seven miles away, a good safe distance from that gigantic explosion there. Let's get back to my question about what if you go faster than a water wave? And if you go faster than a, a water wave, in water, simply you just get this V-shaped shock wave back behind it. It's called a bow wave. Uh, then you might ask the question, well, what if you're in air and you go faster than the speed of sound in air? Which you can do in some you know, high-performance aircraft when you go faster than that 340 meters per second or faster than 770 miles per hour. Um, if you go through a high uh, uh, humidity area, you can temporarily, on occasion, for aircraft that are going faster than the speed of sound, uh, you can see that cone shock wave uh, forming um, that uh, cloud uh, appearance that you see there. But what about light? What if you're in space and you go faster than the speed of light? And the answer is you can't. It, it is, appears to be one of those laws of physics that it's not possible to go faster than 300 million meters per second. I, I, I think one time I went to uh, NASA, I think that's where I saw this uh, the speed limit sign. You can't go faster than um, the speed of, of, of uh, light. And in the metric system, it is, you know, in MKS, meters, kilograms, and seconds, is 300 million meters per second but in miles per second, not miles per hour, but in miles per second, it's 186,000 miles per second. So that's the uh, speed of light in miles per second. This finite speed of light does play a role. I mean, it's really fast, but it's not infinitely fast. One of the things that um, space scientists need to think about when they're communicating with robot rovers, say on the surface of Mars, is that it takes some time for the light 
signals, the radio signals that are a form of light, to get from the robot rover all the way back over to the Earth. And so uh, they had to program these robots to think for themselves because if they would send a radio signal to the, um, um, the rover and tell it to avoid this gigantic cliff here, it would be too late because that radio signal that says turn would arrive several minutes way too late. By the way, this is the, um, I think this is a curiosity. No, nope, it's opportunity. All right, so this is the Opportunity rover, which was, I believe uh, it landed on Mars 2002, 2003. It was supposed to only survive on the surface of Mars for about 90 days. But look at this. It lasted, uh, let's see, 17 years. Uh, it ro would rove around on the surface of Mars. When we get to this section on Mars, we'll show lots of images that were collected by this very resilient rover. And it's uh, kind of funny uh, and also a little bit sad to note that one of the last signals that came from this uh, robot rover on the surface of Mars basically was equivalent to my battery is low and it's getting dark. Uh, so it finally ran out of battery and it was not able to charge it with the solar panels that you see there. Um, there are more rovers on the surface of Mars. So it's one of those things that space scientists and astronomers need to think about when Earth is here and Mars is here, it takes radio signals four minutes to get there. So if we have a person on Mars communicating with a person on Earth, if the person on Earth says hello, it takes four minutes for them to hear hello. And then if the person on Mars says hello, it takes four minutes to get back. So that's a really uh, a big challenge to, for space travel is to think about those time delays because if it's on the other side, it's gonna be 12 minutes between hello and hello. So you pretty much have to have recorded messages, which we're getting really good at, right? In YouTube and TikTok and so forth. Now, if we're looking at the surface of the sun, we're seeing the sun how it was eight minutes ago because it's eight light minutes away. And we're looking at something very distant, like, uh, distant, like the nearby Andromeda galaxy it is uh, millions of light years away. So we're seeing this galaxy how it was 2.9 million years ago. So is, astronomers are sometimes referred to this as look back time. And what this means is that the further you look out into space, the further you're looking back into time. So it's kind of like um, a telescope is a time machine of sorts. If we look at the center of our galaxy, we're seeing it how it was 20,000, uh, 28,000 years ago because it is 28,000 light years away. And so the sun is uh, 8.3 light minutes away. And even when you're looking at the moon, you're seeing how it was 1.2 seconds ago. Oh yeah. And if you're looking at this paper right now, actually, I guess I should have written the screen. You're seeing uh, the screen how it was three nanoseconds ago. So it does take a finite amount of time for the light to get from the screen to your eyeball. <laughs> All right, the last thing we'll talk about here in this section is the inverse square law, which is basically talking about how light gets dimmer as it moves throughout space. We know this because you take a 100 watt light bulb and you move it far enough away and it gets dimmer and dimmer. We know now that just like gravity decreasing with the square of distance, we know that light, the intensity of it, decreases as the square of the distance. What that means is that if you move twice away from a light source, the light is uh, broken up into four pieces. So it's one fourth the brightness. Two squared is four. So it's one fourth the brightness. And if we move three times further away than three square, we get nine here. So it's decreasing the amount of brightness by one ninth. And so if we went four times further, it would be one sixteenth the amount of light uh, brightness. And then say we went 10 times further away, it would be 100 the amount of brightness. So it uh, doesn't just uh, fall off as uh, you know the distance because then it would be half as bright, a third as bright. It goes as the square of the distance. That's why it's called the inverse square law for light.